We are getting very close to the point where religion may become outlawed and the dark forces that run the government systems around the world are out to usher in a new one world religion. So I want to take a brief moment to explain something to everyone. And this is something that may not be very apparent to most people at this moment in time. There is a plan. There is an agenda. And whether this agenda will succeed or not, only time will tell. Many people, because it's been quite some time, well, not that long, but it's been a number of years, have forgotten all about this alleged plan by the elites to form a one world government. Now on the surface, it doesn't really look like that is going to happen anytime soon, but there are a few things that have to happen first in order for that scenario to play out in full. Right now, there seems to be a migrant crisis in several countries around the world, right? In the case of the United States, it's almost as if people are being sent here, or should I say, they are being caused or prompted to immigrate into the US. The way you do that is you cause so much chaos, so much destruction and tribulation that people just want to pack their bags and run away to the nearest, safest community that would take them in. In order to have a one world government, you have to first level the playing field. How do you do that? Well, you level everything off economically, you level everything off morally, and then you do something that many people around the world hold at the highest value. You take away their God. The morality of this world, of this system that we live in, is crumbling. And we've come a very long way, not only from ancient times, but in modern times as well. Slavery, child labor, colonialism, corporal punishment, gender inequality, racial segregation and discrimination, public executions, marital rape and domestic abuse, human sacrifice, dueling, arranged marriages without consent, environmental degradation, treatment of mental illness, discrimination against LGBTQ plus individuals, eugenics, animal cruelty including blood sports like dog fighting and cock fighting, cannibalism, forced conversion to religion, witch hunts and trials, debt bondage and indentured servitude, discrimination based on caste systems, lack of child protection laws, such as child marriage, forced evictions and displacement, human trafficking, discriminatory immigration policies, use of lead and other toxic substances and consumer products, which still occurs, lack of workers' rights and unsafe labor conditions, war crimes, the use of chemical weapons, segregation of people with disabilities, miscegenation laws, laws banning interracial marriage, all these things and more were once upon a time acceptable, morally acceptable by the way in many places. But today of course all of those things are frowned upon. But it seems we have been entering a new era of liberation from morality, haven't we? Before I get too much into this part of the discussion, let me define a few things for you. The terms first world and third world, although they are not used in academic and policy discussions, they are still sometimes used informally. What is a first world country? First, these countries have advanced economies with usually a high GDP. They're industrialized nations with diversified economies. 
The citizens generally enjoy high standards of living, which means access to quality health care, pretty good education, a working infrastructure, and they tend to have social services. First world countries, for the most part, often have stable governments, for the most part. Along with that, strong institutions and respect for the rule of law. They tend to lead in technology and innovation and have a pretty stable infrastructure. First world nations would be countries like the United States, Canada, Western European countries, Germany, France, the UK, Japan, Australia, New Zealand. Russia and China would traditionally be more like second world countries, mainly because of how those countries are led. Now, third world nations, these countries often have lower GDP per capita, less industrialization, and economies that may be more reliant on agriculture or raw materials. The citizens may experience lower standards of living with less access to health care, education, and other social services. Third world countries typically face challenges with political instability, corruption, weak institutions. They may have less developed infrastructure and slow to move forward in technology. We're talking about countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of South Asia, and some in Latin America and the Caribbean. But the classification of third world is somewhat outdated because several of these countries have made significant economic progress. So now, nations are more commonly known as developed or developing or emerging economies. Or sometimes people will describe nations as being economically developed regions global north and less developed or developing regions global south. Now, in order to have a one world government system, you can't have developed countries versus developing countries. You can't have global north versus global south, and you have to eliminate first world and third world countries. How do you do that? You simply get rid of the first world countries and level everything off. You continue to allow third world countries to develop while at the same time you demolish or lead first world nations into a decline. And so this is what they do to achieve this. They implement systems that redistribute wealth and resources from richer nations to poorer ones through global taxes, increased foreign aid or wealth sharing agreements. And we've all seen this happen right here in the States and other places, right? They will start canceling or restructuring the debts of poorer nations to allow them to invest in development without the burden of repaying their debt. And they start enforcing trade policies that ensure fair prices for goods from developing countries. Now, when it comes to education and health care, instead of implementing worldwide programs, to provide access to quality education for everyone, ensuring that every individual has the opportunity to learn and develop skills, they just leave that one alone and let everyone stay ignorant. But what they may do is establish a global healthcare system or plan that ensures all individuals have access to basic healthcare services. They will promote democratic governance and the protection of human rights globally to make sure that all nations have fair and accountable governments. They will try to be anti-corruption when it comes to other nations. On top of that, they'll start enforcing laws and policies that promote gender equality, protecting minority rights, and the ideal of equal opportunities for all social groups. One of the things they have been developing and implementing our global agreements to combat climate change with wealthier nations bearing a greater share of the burden to help poorer nations adapt and develop sustainability. That's all part of a bigger plan. They'll start investing in global infrastructure projects like transportation, energy, communication networks, right? 
They want everyone to be connected to the internet, right? What they will also do is take technology and transfer it from developed nations to developing nations, which allows those countries to skip over certain stages of development and improve their economies and living standards. They want to give more power over to the United Nations to enforce global standards for things like equality, human rights, sustainable development. You see, and at the same time, they bring in this concept of global citizenship, where nations prioritize global well-being over their own national interests to make everyone feel like they have a shared responsibility. We see that happening, don't we? In case you were wondering why they keep giving other countries money while people here go homeless, it's all a part of a plan. They try to manage population growth. They reform institutions like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank to better serve the needs of developing countries with policies that promote inclusive economic growth. And eventually, they will try to go forward with a global currency or a universal basic income system that ensures a minimum standard of living for all people worldwide. They may try using crypto for this. Then you have open borders and migration policies that create more flexible and humane immigration that allows people to move freely in search of better opportunities, helping to balance economic disparities but that puts a greater burden on the citizens in developed nations they won't do it willingly so they will make people do it by starting wars and as a result they start creating global support systems for refugees and displaced persons asylum seekers ensuring their rights and access to opportunities in host countries sometimes giving them free money and free food, sometimes way more than what the average citizen in those countries can get. Again, it's done on purpose. Finally, and this is the hardest part, because this is what people hold to the highest value. They make it so that people having their own religion is a problem. Religious persecution has happened many times before and Several leaders have attempted to ban these practices due to conflict. They want to get people to believe that without religion, then we wouldn't have all these international and cultural conflicts, you see? They'll convince everyone that the goal is to reduce religious conflicts. They want people to see religious beliefs as obstacles to scientific progress, particularly when religious doctrines contradict scientific evidence a world without religion might see fewer barriers to the advancements of science and technology instead of people following their religious doctrines they will try to convince people to adopt more universally based morality on secular humanism emphasizing reason empathy and a shared understanding of human rights which leads to more inclusive and equitable societies, and it also leads to more degenerate societies as a result. But they don't highlight that part. You just have to deal with it. There would be more of a separation of church and state, but you have more secular governments and policies that are not influenced by religious interests, you see? And the problem with this is religion is deeply intertwined with culture, art, music, and traditions. A world without religion might result in the loss of rich cultural heritages, rituals, and practices that have shaped societies for centuries. Religion often provides a sense of community and belonging. Without it, some people might struggle to find a similar sense of social support and shared identity. One big thing is that religion has traditionally been a source of moral guidance for many people. Without it, there could be uncertainty or disagreement about what constitutes right and wrong. 
leading to moral relativism. What we used to believe was wrong, people will start saying, oh, well, it's not wrong anymore. Understand a lot of charitable organizations and humanitarian efforts are driven by religious motivations. In a world without religion, these things might go away, potentially leading to reduced support for vulnerable and disadvantaged people. But I guess they have another plan for them anyways. Religion provides a sense of meaning, purpose, comfort in life, especially in the face of suffering, death, questions about life. Without religion, some people might experience a sense of emptiness or existential crisis. The absence of religion might lead to the rise of new ideologies or belief systems that could be equally dogmatic or divisive, potentially filling the void left by religion with other forms of social or political extremism, like the beast system. They have a bunch of movies that illustrate this, don't they? One of my favorites is Equilibrium, where they outlawed people having feelings or emotions. So they forced everyone to take a certain drug that suppressed those feelings. The impact of a world without religion, ultimately, the positives and negatives would vary depending on individual and societal context, and the transition to a world without religion would likely be complex, but it would not end well, I can tell you that. Eventually, we would end up in a society that was just like the days of Noah, where only just a handful of people still knew God. Well, that's all for now, and there is more to come. I do have a recommended video for the day. Watch that video. It will be linked on screen at the top right corner of this video and in the description box and pinned comment below. Please hit the thumbs up button, leave a comment, and subscribe so you don't miss the next video. Everyone have a great day. Take care, folks, and as always, friends, stay awake, stay aware, stay safe, and I'll talk to you all soon.